So next, I would like to welcome to the stage um, someone who's been involved with our efforts from the inception, Dr. Liz Tosh. And she is now with Wine Market Council, formerly and still probably does some work with Sonoma State University as well, and also is the author of our human resources chapter in the code, which again, has lived on and continue to adapt and evolve. And we are so grateful to have you here. Oh, thank you, Allison. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I actually live in uh, Sonoma County. So I drove over yesterday, about a two hour and 15 minute drive. And um, I love coming to Lodi. I've been here many times. And I know some of you yesterday had a chance to walk in the vineyards. And what I love about Lodi is that this is the place of the largest number of acres of old vine vineyards in all of America. And I just wrote an article about this interviewing Randy Capricio, who many of you know here in Lodi, uh, in Forbes. And um, basically what we discovered now with old vines, and, and Lodi is helping make this happen, is they sort of have the secret of survival in their DNA because they've lived for over a hundred years. And so we can learn so much from them, especially with what's happening with the extreme climate change conditions. So this is a very special place here on earth in Lodi. And I love coming over and seeing those beautiful ancient vines that look like a, a work of art. Anyway, I've been asked to come and talk to you about uh, a quick market research update, but mainly focusing on what consumers want from um, from sustainability and from sustainable wine. And I'll leave with a few potential action items as well. So um, just to let you know, in terms of Wine Market Council, um, I just became the president in August and I retired from Sonoma State, which was 823 years of greatness. And now, and now I'm here, so this is fun. It's a part-time job, but we are a nonprofit. And what we do is we basically do research only on the US wine consumer in terms of their purchasing habits, attitudes, and trends. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing some of our high level data regarding sustainability on that. Um, for our members, we have a lot of proprietary reports where we have much, much deeper detail, but we do go out and present at conferences and share high level data. And I know we have a number of Wine Market Council members in the audience today. So thank you for being members and supporting our nonprofit. We try to believe that the, the data we share will help all wine businesses improve their marketing and brand strategies. We also have a lot of partners, Nelson IQ, Danny Greger, Gomberg Fredrickson, and so forth. So I'm going to be sharing a little data from them as well as we go along. But I want to start with the big picture overview. This is from John Mora Marco, who works at Gomberg Fredrickson and BW166. And I just emailed him like at six this morning saying, John, is this data still correct? And he's like, yes, it is. <laughs> And so uh, 377 million cases uh, of ending the year in 2023 uh, were sold in the U.S. That's down 9% in volume. I think we've all heard that we're down in volume. And keep in mind, that's all imported wine as well. I know we have a number of international people in the audience. So every, one out of every four bottles of wine sold in the U.S. is imported. So that's part of that number. And then the, um, the 107 billion is the value. And I said, John, is that still correct? He goes, yes, it is. But we will not have the final numbers until um, July. But that's actually a little bit higher than people were saying. So people are buying less volume, but they're spending a little bit more. And sustainability is a piece of that. So here's sort of what this picture looks like. I always like to tell people to take a look, a look at the big picture, no, not just freak out about what this year was compared to last. Look at the big picture because we've been through these types of decline in volume before. Uh, this is going back to 34. And you can see in the um, 1990s, we had a slump. And now we're, we're having one that, again. And if we look at the uh, wine, US wine consumption data from Wine Institute, thank you, gallons per capita, we see the exact same trends. In the 90s, we were facing some of the similar issues we're facing today that Bobby just mentioned. Anti-alcoholism trends, excise taxes, and big beer really coming on strong then. Now again, we have these trends anti-alcohol sentiment sweeping the nation. Inflation, has anybody gone to the grocery store lately? I'm still having trouble believing how much things went up at Trader Joe's. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and there's a lot more choices, you know, uh, than there was, um, you know, 20 years ago. So um, because of that, 
we do see not only wine sales down, but beer and spirits as well. So this is from multiple sources. As you can see, we have the three tier system on your uh, right side and then uh, the DTC, sorry, it's the other way around, left, right. DTC is also down. So I guess we can say if misery loves company, wine's not the only one that's down in volume sales. Um, and then uh, when we look at what's causing this, actually at Wine Market Council last year, we spent a lot of money on a huge study saying, okay, what's causing this? Why are people buying less volume wine? Where, what are they buying instead? And this is what we discovered. Overall, the number one reason people are buying less wine is this whole uh, alcohol moderation trend, uh, this whole health and wellness uh, thing that's going on. Um, and when you think about it, wine sales were actually up during the first part of COVID, 20 and 21, they were up. It wasn't until 2022 that we started to see this decline. And um, I, I like to call it the COVID hangover, because just think about it. You know, remember when you were back in college and you partied really hard and had a good time, and the next morning you woke up and said, I'm going to be healthy now. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat well. I'm not going to drink as much. And I think that's what's happening. That's going on as well right now, in addition to all of the other uh, information that we see in the news. The inflation is still impacting people. Think about, again, those prices at the grocery store we found with lower income consumers are just not buying wine as much anymore. So many drink options, RTDs, we need more wine RTDs, folks. Yes, we do. Uh, and this is a scary one that we can change. We've discovered in our research, and I'll mention it more in a few minutes, that people think wine has sugar added to it, okay? Um, and then also uh, wine is just losing some occasions. We need to remind people of all the happy occasions to drink wine. So uh, looking at the popular uh, wine uh, varietals, um, Chardonnay still is number one in volume and Cabernet is number two, but if you look at value, Cabernet is the top one. Um, but the area that's actually growing, if we just wanna look at varietals is um, Sauvignon Blanc, a happy place right now. Um, in terms of pricing, the average price last year for a bottle of wine sold in the U.S. market was $12.09. And sort of that sweet spot where more than 50% of the wine is sold is right in the middle there, which is the $10 to $20 range. Um, and um, so you can sort of see the share on the left-hand side and the percentages on the right-hand side. That's inflation. Um, and then if we look at DTC sales, we see the same thing. Um, value was actually flat and volume went down. And DTC pricing is more, $48 um, a bottle. So let's dive into the consumer and then start looking at what they think of in terms of sustainability. So the good news is that there are 80 million adults in the United States who drink wine out of a population of what, we have 335 million now. That's a lot. Um, just think the country, whole country of France is only 60 million people. So 80 million people, no wonder the U.S. is the number one target for every single exporter <laughs> of wine in the world, because we definitely consume a lot of wine. And if we take those 80 million people and segment them into core versus marginal drinkers, you can see that 20% are core and 14% are marginal. So um, core drinkers are people who drink wine once a week or more. I think many of us in this room fit that category. And marginal drinkers are those who drink wine less than once a week, uh, but more often than every two to three months. Then we have the non-adopters. These are the beer drinkers and spirits drinkers. Infrequent and then the abstainers. So if we look at gender, we have more women who drink wine than men. This is pretty normal in most countries around the world. Um, and then the thing a lot of us are concerned about is age and generation. 9% um, of Gen Z drinks wine. Um, which is sort of low, um, but keep in mind that right now the oldest one is 26, and only uh, a third of them have reached age 21. So we have we have more of them coming on, and they're they're actually a larger, slightly larger generation than millennials. Mm -hmm. Millennials now are really starting to step up to the plate. There was a while when they weren't adopting wine, but that whole story has changed, especially now that they're in their 30s primarily. 
Um, so the youngest millennial is 27, the oldest is 42. So that's, uh, we have this huge group in their 30s, and that's when people start settling down, having families, having houses, better income, and wine is a drink of moderation for many of them. And we've now discovered that higher income millennials spend more than baby boomers. Um, Gen X and then baby boomers are still the largest at 32%. Um, if we look at income, income definitely has something to do with wine. So most people who drink wine are making, um, you know, 53% are making 100K or more uh, per year. And um, wine is a little more expensive per serving when you compare it to beer or spirits. So that makes sense. And if we look at race, uh, we, this, this may not look positive, but it actually is. We've made progress in ethnicity in the U.S. 66% um, white, used to be 76. And we are now, if we look at the U.S. Um, census and we index against the percentage in the population, we are actually have made progress with black and Asian wine consumers. We still have more work to do with Hispanic. Why do people drink wine? Number one reason, it's relaxing. It's a lovely thing to have at the end of the day to decompress around the dinner table with your family or with friends. Um, it complements food, uh, lots of choices, tastes better. And it says positive health benefits. That's what consumers say. Obviously, we're not allowed legally to mention that. But when you ask them what they mean by that, they say, it's a drink of moderation. Wine is a drink of moderation. And I think that this is an important thing for us to remember. It's also connecting. They think of it, it's the most romantic drink out there, more so than beer and spirits. So a couple trends. Uh, the low alcohol trend is one we've heard about. It's continuing to grow. Uh, this was part of our category shifting study. As you can see, there's more people drinking at the lower levels of alcohol than the higher levels of alcohol. That's why we see this whole category growing low alcohol uh, as well as no, no alcohol. Um, uh, this ingredient awareness is, is very important and this sort of gets to sustainability. Um, we did this study um, in 2022 and 38% of consumers want wine ingredient labeling and 36% want the nutrition labeling with the calories and carbs and so forth. Um, and if you look at, if you break this down by age, it's much higher with Gen Z and millennials. They really want this. Of course, it's not legal yet in this country, but we are seeing more and more wineries starting to voluntarily add this to the label. And here's that scary 47% of consumers think wine has sugar added to it. So um, I'll talk again more about solutions there are quite simple to address this one. Um, so the, the where are they shifting to? A lot of them are shifting more to spirits. Um, these RTDs are so strong. And there are some successful wineries who are making RTDs. I realize this is too difficult. Uh, for a tiny little family winery, you're, probably, you're not going to do this. But the medium and the larger wineries can. Um, and some have been very successful. So room in the, uh, in the market there. Cocktails are so important. And I just keep, if you have a tasting room, serve a wine cocktail at your tasting room. Let people know what else there is to do with wine. This is very common in other parts of the world. We just don't do it much in the United States. Consumers don't even know there are wine cocktails. So uh, we need to remind them that wine has been around for ages and ages, 8,000 years, and has been made to make wine cocktails. And if you look at the very bottom, wine-based drinks like sangria, wine spritzers are growing also in um, in volume. So what do people drink besides wine? Well, guess what? A lot of wine drinkers also drink other things. You probably do too. I know I do. 13% um, only drink wine. But you, do, you have this non-alcoholic category growing. The red is the core and the, um, and the yellow there is the, is the um, sorry, the red is the marginal, the, the yellow is the core. So 15% of our core wine consumers are now drinking non-alcoholic wine, beer, and spirits. Um, that's something to think about. The seltzers are growing and so forth there. Okay, let's dive into our um, sustainable wine data. So this is a study we just did with um, Nelson, where they look, took a deep dive into Gen Z to just try to understand what's making this generation tick. 
Um, so keep in mind that um, that if you combine Gen Z and millennials together, this is 42% of the population. Um, but Gen Z is very important because they're going to be, as I mentioned, slightly larger than millennials. 21, um, 10,000 Gen Zs turn 21 every day. And we already talked about their current age, but this is what they're concerned about. And this is why sustainability is so important and talking specifically about what you're doing in terms of air pollution, climate change, water shortages, water pollution, um, animal welfare, very important to this group, uh, waste of food. I don't know that we can talk about that in the wine industry, but um, and, um, but all these other things we are, that's part of our sustainability programs, but just the word sustainability is not enough. <clears throat> they want to know specifics about these things. Look at social sustainability. It's really high with this group, very concerned about social sustainability. 34% are more likely to purchase products with companies that support LGBTQ plus communities. 46% agree they're more likely to purchase products that support race and ethnicity and minorities. And 46% agree they're more likely to purchase your products if you're socially responsible and active. That means you need to talk about what you're doing. I don't think the wine industry is doing enough to communicate all the good things we're doing in environmental and social responsibility. Okay, let's look at understanding of terms. Now, this is actually from our 2018 green study, which we're hoping to repeat again in early 25 if we get the funding. Um, we try to do this study every few years. Um, but it, it, we ask consumers, how, how much do you understand what these terms mean on your wine label? So not, uh, the organic one always comes up top. People just understand organic because, you know, it's in fruit and food and everything. So that's easy for them. 90% understand that. 70%, 77% organic wine. But 71% sustainably produced, that's pretty high. I was impressed by that. So 71% say they're quite sure about the meaning or they're fairly confident about its meaning. So there you go, Allison. 71% of consumers know <laughs> what sustainability means, wine consumers. Um, what's even more important is there's a very strong correlation between confidence of understanding and the purchasing of these wines, okay? Now let's look at who's the most concerned. Probably not a surprise to see that Gen Z and the millennials always or often purchase sustainable and organic wines. So we ask people, when you're going to buy a wine, what do you consider? And we give them a big, long list of things. And you can just see, you know, it's so much more important to this younger generation. But they're also very skeptical, especially Gen Zs. That's why you really need to make sure you give them the science and the numbers. They actually like statistics behind these things. Now, you can't put the statistics on the label, probably, but we'll talk about where you can put them. All right. Now, look at baby boomers. The oldest... The youngest baby boomer is now uh, 59. So most baby boomers are in their 60s and 70s. And think about, you know, when they were growing up, people didn't really talk so much about sustainability. So it may not be that surprising that only 13% of them care about this, okay? But um, I think that is growing too um, in the baby boomer. Any baby boomers in the, in the room here? I think you probably still look for sustainable wines. Okay, so we also looked at gender and high income, and this sort of surprised me that 29% of males versus 21% of females look for sustainable or organic wine. I know I thought it was going to be the reverse, personally, but <laughs> that's how it turned out, and um, that might we want to dig into deeper with our deeper dives into our data. And, um, but if we look at high-end consumers, now high-end consumers are people who regularly spend $20 or more on a bottle of wine. These are precious consumers and we love them a lot, right? Um, they really care about sustainability and organic. So that's something to think about as well. And in fact, when we dive deeper, we did a huge study on high-end consumers last year. Part of the reason they spend more on wine is because they believe it has it's made in a clean, cleaner, more natural fashion. It has fewer additives. So they, they really are looking for that. Um, so this is also a, an older a fact, and I would like to just 
I can't wait to redo this study, hopefully, if we get the money next year. Um, Two dollar more per premium is what consumers are willing to pay per bottle for sustainable organic wine. It, it, interestingly, it's two dollars for both. Um, so this is important, but there is a point of no return though. Um, so if the wine starts getting more and more expensive, um, it, 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 it does go down. However, I, I think that if we did the study again, this is 2018, that, that the numbers might be higher there. So let's move to social responsibility. What do consumers want? We just we did, did a big multicultural study in 2022, um, taking a deep dive into what multicultural consumers want from wine. And there were seven action steps that came out. The bottom three have to do with social sustainability issues. But one of the key ones was hire people who look like me. Okay, and we're going to talk about this in our in our um, social responsibility panel this afternoon. But look at number number five. So that representation matters in the workforce. Okay, hiring people in your tasting rooms, hiring winemakers who look like me. Okay, um, and not just for that reason, but also to create to improve creativity and innovation uh, and new insights in your company. Um, the other thing is show they know and respect the diverse communities in which they do business. Be visible, be visible in the long term. So be out there helping and also making sure you, you document that on your website, what you're doing. And number seven, reach out and build relationships with organizations that serve diverse communities. And we have a couple people on our panel this afternoon who are gonna talk more about how to do that. So this piece is, is very important as well. So um, I'm going to sort of, um, I'm almost to the end here where I'm, I don't have any, I don't have any numbers. There is a number. Okay. There's a number out. I have to stop. Oh, I have three minutes. Okay. That's no problem. I can do that. Okay. So these are trade perceptions. Uh, Christian worked with, um, our research director worked with uh, CSWA to do this. I thought this was interesting because they interviewed importers and retailers from on-premise and off-premise and said, do you care about sustainability? Do consumers care about sustainability? Look at this. There is an increased consumer demand for sustainably produced wines. 90% of importers and distributors said that, 73% of on-premise retailers, and 86% of off. So they're seeing it out there. They're having consumers come in and ask for this. Um, this also came out of that survey. And there's Lodi. 26% of consumers in the United States know what Lodi rules is. That's pretty amazing when you think of all 50 states. And 48% know what the California Sustainable um, Certification is. Um, but still organic, you know, USDA organic just is, is way out there. Um, and let's see, okay, this is my conclusion. So I have seven potential action items and they're pretty simple uh, and easy to do. Number one, Include sustainable organic farming practices on your wine labels and packages. So if you are certified, put the seal, okay? Now, obviously you're not gonna be able to put all the details, so use a QR code. I mean, you're dealing, especially this younger generation, they love QR codes. And so take it right to your website. Now, when they get to your website, don't make them, because I get so frustrated when I go look for this information on people's website and I can't find it, don't hide your sustainability efforts down underneath some tab at the fifth one down or something like that. Have it right up on that front menu. It's so important in wine. Have a sustainability tab and underneath of it, describe what you're specifically doing in your environment for your employees and in your community and include your statistics and your numbers on the progress. For example, 70% of our energy is from wind power, or we've reduced our waste by 56%, or whatever. Have those, I know it sounds boring, but it's not to a lot of these consumers. They want to know. That way you can also prevent being called um, greenwashing. Four, hire more diverse workforce, okay? We're, we're starting to make some improvement in this. There's more to do. Um, and this is sort of what Bobby was talking about earlier. Communicate the positive aspects of your wine. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling everybody, put no sugar added on your label, please. You know, <laughs> just let them know you didn't put sugar in the wine. Um, and that you're vegan friendly. Most wines are vegan friendly. The other thing too is the average glass 
of wine, 120 calories, both red and white. Go look it up on the the, the um, F F FDA website. Five carbs, five ounce per serving. Okay, yours might be a little more, but give them that information. Believe me, they want it. Locally made, make sure you say that, small family business, that's all important. Um, consider making at least one lower alcohol wine, okay? And offer more sustainability tours. I don't see enough wineries doing this and consumers love them. I, I went over to La Crema and I know we have some Jackson family people in the room. I was blown away by the sustainability tour. In fact, they tell me it's sold out for months in advance. And they put you on a tractor. Of course, they give you a glass of wine first, put you on this cute little tractor. You get to go around through the vineyards and they tell you everything they're doing. And you get to see the chickens and you get to see the sheep and the sheep dog. And a lot of people take selfies with the chickens and post them, you know, and people love it. So we need more of that. Thank you very much.